when I see starling flocks, I feel a great sense of wonder and of beauty at the same time. Starling uh, spend uh, most of their time in the northeast of Europe and uh, for the winter they go south and south for them means Italy and Rome in particular. They spend the night in the city center, it's warmer in the city center and then in the morning they wake up and they go feeding in the countryside because there's not enough food for them in the city center. In the evening they come back but before setting down on the trees, which we call their roost, for 20, 15 minutes, they do this incredible aerial display just at sunset. And then they sit down on the trees for the night. They are so chatty and loudy for the whole night that I wonder actually uh, when they sleep. During these 15 minutes of aerial display of beautiful dance, they are heavily subject to predation on peregrine falcons. Falcons know that starlings come back every night in the same place, so they have their nests all around the roosting site and they just wait for the starling every night to come back. And while starlings do this aerial display, falcons go preying on them and uh, eating some of them. It's really weird then why starlings would do that. Because when they set down on the trees, falcons do not hunt them anymore. It's just too difficult for them because uh, uh, they are scared by the branches of the trees. Uh, falcons are very delicate birds in a way. Starlings are safe when they are on the trees. So why, before getting down on the trees, they do that 15-20 minutes of dance, giving the chance to the falcon to prey on them, it's a mystery for me and I think for many people. We do not have any uh, clear theory about why this happens. And it's funny because uh, sometimes people say that flocking it's an anti-predatory uh, behavior, uh, which is in a way true, but in another way false. It is true because if you are alone, if you are isolated as a bird, then the falcon will certainly pick up you uh, so joining the flock is certainly a good thing to do, so you don't want to remain isolated as a starling. So in this sense, the collective behavior of flocking is good. On the other hand, if there were no flocking at all, just staying down in the trees, that would be by far the safest thing to do, but they don't. So they must have a very good reason for doing that, and I have no idea what that is. It could be a social reason. Uh, or there is another theory which says that these amazing clouds of birds are actually a signal for other birds in order to say where the roosting site is. So just like uh, smoke signals in a way. It could be, we have absolutely no support for this theory either. Personally, I'm more inclined to think it is a social thing. It's something really similar to playing or something like that. Or it could be simply a very complicated queuing process. They have to get down on the trees. Not all the trees are the same and anyway you have to wait until other flocks have settled down on the trees and so there is a queuing system. You cannot just go down immediately and while you queue to set on the trees you do the display. That could be another reason. We don't know why, however, as physicists, uh, we are more interested in the how, how they do that. Uh, on the other hand, biologists tend to ask the why of, of phenomena, of biological phenomena. And this is a difference between physics and biology. We are interested in the how it happens. So what are the rules that uh, makes that phenomenon happening? What we believe First of all is that there is no leadership in this phenomenon. It's not a top-down phenomenon. Birds are not all following a leader. They're not all following uh, the smartest bird or the most informed bird about where they're going. So we think it's a bottom-up phenomenon. They're all equal. They're all the same. And they're all using the same rules 
for interacting, for communicating with the other birds. This is the first thing that we have discovered from our data, that it's really a self-organized phenomenon with no leadership. So then this seems to be even more mysterious because if you don't have a leader, how they manage to go all in the same direction, for example. So one possible explanation would be they're all going, uh, I don't know, up north. So if they all decide to go up north, there is no need for following any leader. And that is a possibility, for example, when you have a migration. But remember, what we're seeing here in the case of starlings, it's a dance of random motion in the sky. So they're not going anywhere. But while they're doing that, they're all going in the same direction. So how do they manage to all go in the same direction without a leader? What scientists believe, uh, including ourselves, is that by just obeying a set of very simple interaction rules, uh, you can manage that. First of all, you only speak or interact or watch with your nearest neighbors. There's no need to uh, keep under control all the rest of the flock. You simply need to interact with your neighbors. Then, basically what you do is to imitate your neighbors. Whatever they're doing, more or less you try to do the same. But everybody's doing that. This is the important thing. It's not that your neighbors are different from you. You are trying to copy your neighbors. Your neighbors are trying to copy you. And this is the same for every other bird. And this interaction, again, only happens very locally. It's not that I try to do what all the rest of the flock does. I only try to copy the behavior of my nearest neighbors. Now, as surprisingly as this may seem, this very simple rule of behavior, under certain conditions, give rise to global order in the group. When I say under special condition, what I basically say is that your imitation must be fairly accurate. So if you are fairly good in imitating your neighbors, then the whole system can make a transition to an ordered state. So this is the first point, interaction. Interaction is simply need to be short range. You imitate your neighbors. Perhaps you also do something else. Perhaps you keep a minimum distance from your neighbor. You don't want to crash into your neighbors, like when you're driving on the motorway. You don't want to get too far, so you're also attracted a little bit by your neighbors. If you find yourself isolated, you don't want to go back to your flock. But apart from this, what you do is to copy the behavior of your neighbors. In the case of starlings, behavior means the direction of motion, in what direction you're flying. So, you're trying to fly in the same direction as your neighbors, and this grants the collective behavior of the group. We found evidence in our data that this really happens on a very short local scale. Basically, birds interact with a couple of neighbors, seven, eight, ten neighbors, let's say on average seven, but this is an average figure. And this is enough to create order on a flock of 10,000 birds. There is something else, however, that you need to do. Now, imagine that you have achieved, as a flock, global order, just by interacting with your neighbors. Now, imagine that a falcon arrives, a bird at some point of the flock detects the falcon, bad news, let's get away from it. And so that bird will change its direction of motion. Now, what you want is that the entire flocks now change the direction of motion accordingly. You're asking the system to change its behavior as it were just one entity. So in order to study this, you don't simply need to study the interaction, but you need to study correlation. And correlation is something different from interaction. The best way to understand what correlation is, is to think about the phone game. You have a line of children, and you have an initial message. And you want to transfer the message through the chain of children, to the line of children. So when you do that, so the first child whispers uh, the message in the ear of, its, of the other child, which is sitting nearby. 
directly transferring the information to just one child. So this is what we would call the interaction. The rule of behavior is just speak to your nearest neighbor. However, then the nearest neighbor will speak, will whisper the message in the ear of the other child. And then the other child, the other child, and so on. So the message travels through the whole chain. And at some point, the message will be disrupted because I miss a word, the other child misses another word. So at some point, the message can be completely destroyed. However, it still travels for a couple of kids. So let's say that the message gets destroyed after traveling 10 children. Beyond the 10 children, you completely lose the meaning of the original message. So in that case, you have two scales of length. The first one is one. You only speak to one child, and that is the interaction. But the other scale is 10. You manage to transfer the message through 10 children, and you never spoke directly to the 10th child. So this second quantity is correlation. You can create correlation in a system simply by speaking to the people which are right next to you. Now, what you need to transfer a message from one side of the flock to the other side of the flock, it's a very large correlation. And this is exactly what happens in flocks and what we have detected in our data, that the correlation is very strong in flocks. So, it seems that this, with this mixture of local interaction and global correlation, flocks are able at the same time to keep all doing the same thing, to keep all having the same behavior, but also to change very eff effectively their behavior when they need to react to an external perturbation. So these two ingredients, local interaction and global correlation, I think are the key of understanding the flock behavior. What we discover is that the interaction in, uh, between birds and starlings in particular is of a different nature compared to the one that happens in physics. They do interact only with their nearest neighbors, but they interact with a fixed number of neighbors irrespective of their physical distance. To measure distance, that birds are using unit of birds, not unit of meters. So they measure the nearest neighbor, the second nearest neighbor, the third nearest neighbor, and that is their metric, is the way they measure distance, not meters. So because of that, then, when a bird goes away from the flock, it doesn't matter that the distance is increasing. He still wants to get aligned or to imitate the behavior of the seventh nearest neighbor, which now they will be at 10 meters away or 20 meters away. But it doesn't care. It's always interacting with a fixed number of neighbors. And this is why flocks can get back together. But in the distances that we measure in the field, the interaction is not based on the physical distance, but on what we call the topological distance. For example, when you take uh, the metro, you do not measure the distance in unit of kilometers, but in unit of stops. You say, OK, I have to run five stops. Don't care about the real physical distance, because all the time is opening and closing the doors between stops. We never saw collisions in our data. They seem to be ruled by almost nearly perfect coordination. So, no, no evidence of collisions in our data. <laughs>